We're actually going to be jumping right into our um, midday keynote. So if, uh, if you'd like to stay seated. So at the Cyber Investing Summit, uh, we're, we're really excited to be the first event really to uh, create the intersection of investing in cybersecurity. And we're always very excited to, to see who we're able to bring out on the stage to, to keynote this event. Uh, this year, we're, we're thrilled and honored to have uh, the second U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security under President George W. Bush, a man that probably needs very little introduction in front of this audience, so I'll let him do the speaking. Um, we have Secretary Michael Chertoff, uh, founder of the Chertoff Group, as well as many other accomplishments, and here he is today to be your keynote address. Andrew, thank you very much, and uh, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I'm standing between you and lunch, <clears throat> but I'm hopefully I can keep your attention. Uh, let me just begin, uh, before we get to the issue of cybersecurity, to observe that um, there was a terrible, uh, dastardly terrorist attack in Manchester yesterday, and I know all of our uh, thoughts and prayers go to the family members of those who were lost and those who've been injured. Um, we know that the courageous and skilled authorities in Britain are working very, very hard, not obviously uh, just in terms of dealing with the suicide bomber who's no longer a threat, but with any individuals who might have been acting in concert. So it reminds us once again we live in a dangerous world and uh, we have to work together uh, to uh, remember that it's good versus evil and we have to stamp out evil. Now, we do see a lot of evil in the area of cyber as well. You know, the internet, as you all know, when it was originally founded, was really meant to be a method of communication among academics and government officials who were trusted. So the original design of the internet, which was essentially a resilience method of communication that moved you from point to point communication into the ability to exploit alternative pathways to route data, um, that was built without much consideration of the significance of trust as a critical foundational element. And as a consequence, when the internet became a commercial activity and not merely a, an academic or government activity, the lack of trust as a foundational issue created a real vulnerability, and we still see that today. <clears throat> we don't always know who we're dealing with, and many of the tools that we use in real life to identify whether we can rely on somebody are absent on the internet. Uh, probably my favorite cartoon is one that appeared many years ago in The New Yorker, showing two dogs in front of a PC, and one dog says to the other, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And the truth is, that's still the case. Um, if you've been reading the news lately, you see that, in fact, there's been an uptick in both the scope, the frequency, and the consequence of significant cyber attacks. And maybe uh, more noteworthy in the most recent news we've seen in the last year is the increasing involvement of nation states in using uh, or exploiting the internet, not merely for national security espionage, but actually in partnership with criminal organizations, where the criminals get something from a profit motive, and the nation states appear to get something either from a intelligence collection um, opportunity or simply to disrupt their adversaries. Two recent examples. Um, the uh, Wanna Cry episode of ransomware that we've been reading about that really spread around the entire world um, looks to have been, although I, I'm relying simply on public reporting, potentially connected to the North Koreans. Now, Wanna Cry is kind of an interesting um, episode because in many ways, the vulnerability was one that if you were updating patches on your Microsoft, you could have avoided. And in a sense, what was exploited was the either unwillingness or the lack of understanding on the part of many users of the software that you do need to pay attention to patching and updating and upgrading your software. It also illustrates a major vulnerability in our internet ecosystem when you deal with pirated software which doesn't get notified about updates or patches, and therefore becomes an enormously vulnerable battle space for bad actors. Another recent news story brought the Russians involved. I'm not talking about the DNC hack here. I'm talking about the hack into 500 million user accounts on Yahoo, which gave the hackers access to a 
literally a treasure trove of credentials that can be, then be used as a platform to pursue other things. And there was an indictment several months ago in which not only two criminals, including one of whom was, who was quite well known, but two Russian intelligence officials were indicted as part of that, thereby indicating the US government allegation that Russian intelligence was actually involved and engaged with the process of hacking these credentials. And again, it's not hard to see the value both to criminals and intelligence agencies to this kind of activity. Criminals get credentials that they can use to steal money, and intelligence agents can use that to infiltrate adversaries or people in whom they have an interest, and then have that as a platform to gather further intelligence. So this simply reminds us that literally every week, we have more and more developments in the area of cybersecurity. But now let me focus in particular on this industry, the financial services industry, and talk a little bit about both the challenges we face and where the solutions might lie. If you are in the financial services area, you have multiple activities that you engage in. They're going to be attractive to thieves or even nation states, and also create risk to you in terms of consequences if you do get hacked. First of all, there's the activity of transferring funds, simply moving funds from the payor to the payee. If those funds get diverted, that becomes an economic loss to the financial institution that is supposed to be executing the transaction accurately. If you're engaged in any kind of merger and acquisition activity, you have market-sensitive data. There used to be a phenomenon, well, there still is a phenomenon called insider trading. Now we have outsider trading. People who hack into databases see that a transaction is being contemplated and trade ahead of the transaction. If you run a trading platform, you also understand the significance of latency in executing trades. Even a few seconds of delay, if someone sees where you're headed, gives that person an opportunity to jump ahead of the transaction. And so that becomes another vulnerability if you're engaged in that element of financial services. Availability is a vulnerability. If you have customer-facing activities, for example, ATM machines, or other ways in which your customers transact business over the internet, and all of a sudden their ability to pay their bills or to uh, pay, meet their payroll winds up getting compromised or delayed or unavailable, that becomes a very big problem, not just for them, but for you as the institution. And finally, there's the issue which I think most concerns national security people, which is the integrity of financial data. If someone were to interfere with the integrity of the data over the financial system on a global basis, such that people began to wonder whether the data they were getting was accurate, whether the balances were accurate, um, whether the records of transactions were accurate, you could then have a crisis of confidence in the financial system as a whole. We saw a little bit of a taste of that in 2009, when you'll remember there was a financial meltdown and there was a period of time in the fall that people began to wonder about the integrity of the balance sheets and the asset and, and profit and loss statements of some financial institutions. And that immediately had a dampening effect on global transactions and on the global economy. So all of these are issues which need to concern the financial services industry, and which is why this is a sector that is perhaps more than any other acutely aware of the fact that you have to consider cybersecurity as a foundational issue when you deal with all of your, your major risks. Let me give you just a little bit of a sense of some of the attacks that the industry has suffered, again, in the last couple of years. <clears throat> One of the most remarkable <clears throat> a couple of years ago, in the last couple of years, was the Bank of Bangladesh theft of $81 million from the a bank's account at the Federal Reserve Bank here in New York. Now, originally, the bad guys, and again, there's been attribution in the press uh, to various sources that it was North Koreans who were behind this. Uh, but essentially, what the bad guys did is they stole the credentials of the Bank of Bangladesh, which was not doing a very good job of updating uh, its credentials and its authorities, and was also beginning to kind of work around some of the authentication uh, requirements. They stole the credentials, and then in a weekend, put in orders for approximately $1 billion of transfer from the account into various accounts in the Philippines. As it happened, about $80 million were executed uh, based on this fraud. And the reason it was uncovered is apparently a clerk uh, 
or a, an official in Sri Lanka started to look at the actual instructions and saw spelling errors, and that all of a sudden created an aha moment, maybe there's a problem with these transactions. But it indicates, again, how the loss of credentials can be a serious issue in terms of transfer of funds. Less well publicized, <clears throat> but again recently, were German banks that had accounts hacked and had money transfers authorized by thieves who circumvented dual authentication. The protocol that, <clears throat> that these banks had in place was to take texting as your second method of verification of a transaction. And that was based on the assumption that the texts would be genuine and would verify the email instructions to transfer money. <clears throat> there is apparently a flaw in the telecommunications backbone that helps route and connect SMS texting. It's called SS7. And what the thieves were able to do was to hack into that and divert the process of sending SMS texts so that they could essentially hijack it and verify masquerading as the actual account holder, that second level of authentication. That indicates, again, that even dual authentication can be exploited and become a vulnerability rather than a protection. In 2016, <clears throat> criminals in Brazil created dummy websites uh, appearing to be those of genuine banks. And then when customers logged in to engage in transactions, their credentials were stolen and used in order to divert the money into the hands of the criminals. It's similar to what we know as a watering hole when a fake website is set up. All of these are literally real world examples of what is going on now that is affecting not only the economics of the financial services industry, but public trust in their ability to transact over the internet. So how do we deal with this? Well, the short answer is there is no magic bullet. Um, it is about understanding the risk and coming up with a multi-layered approach to managing that risk. Um, there's an old saying that there are two types of enterprises. Those that admit they've been hacked and those don't, that don't know they've been hacked. And I think that's probably a pretty accurate statement of the way the world is. If you believe that any enterprise is immune from being penetrated at all, uh, then it's a little bit like if I go to my doctor and say, doctor, I want you to promise me I'm never going get, to get sick for the rest of my life. It can happen. The way actually medicine works is with the understanding that sometimes you will be penetrated by bacteria or viruses. And the important thing is, when that happens, how do you react to it? Do you have a healthy immune system? Have you been vaccinated so your immune system has data about the viruses or bacteria that might be coming in? Are you doing things to increase your body's defenses? And this is kind of a, an interesting example of a defense in depth, which I think is equally applicable to what we ought to be looking at in the world of cybersecurity. The second point I would make out is, it make, make is it's not just about understanding that security is not simply a marginal line, but it is defense in depth. Security is not about technology alone. Technology, if it's not embedded within a strategy, and a constant of operations is just a lot of stuff you buy that sits on your network and you don't really know whether it's helping you or not. What cybersecurity is about <clears throat> is people, processes, and technology. It's a strategy and an architecture of how you defend yourself based on what your key assets and your key vulnerabilities are, and then building around that a way to process so as to ma minimize risk, train your people so they know how to handle risk, and then use technology to enable the concept of operations that you have built. And just to give you a, a kind of a brief survey of some of the kinds of things I think you have to deal with as you think about this architecture, I go back to the wanna cry uh, episode. The sad thing about this is, um, in many ways, this was avoidable for a lot of institutions if they had checked the patches that were sent out in March by Microsoft. And sometimes it seems like a cybersecurity emphasis on updating your patches, knowing who connects to your network, making sure you're upgrading your network, seems like, oh, come on, that's trivial. That that's, shouldn't excite people in the security business because that's something that everybody does. But they don't do it. And making it easy to do and coming up with protocols and requirements that essentially push people into doing it while assuring them that the updates are genuine, because that's the flip side. You have to make sure you're not updating with malware. 
That is actually a foundational element of having cybersecurity that takes a, a fair bit of hay off the haystack. Uh, multiple factor authentication. I spoke about the German example where someone exploited the um, uh, telecom vulnerability to circumvent dual factor authentication. It still doesn't change the fact that dual factor authentication is better than single factor authentication. The key is to think through what that second factor is. You know, one really good second factor, which I've used myself is, if there's gonna be a transaction, the person that you deal with, who you know, ho hopefully, calls you on the phone and you wind up verifying it orally. I understand that now there's software people claim can imitate your voice, but again, if we're talking about reducing the risk, if someone calls me on my cell phone and they recognize my voice, chances are that's, that's pretty robust. A third and I think increasingly important element is behavioral monitoring. That's looking at what goes on in the network to determine whether there's a question or a problem or not. We sometimes talk about that issue in terms of insiders, making sure people on the inside are not stealing or, or diverting funds. But it's actually true if you're looking at transactions. I, I was dealing with a financial institution that was running an exercise where they were trying to think through how, what would you do if there was a serious compromise of your credentials or of the customer's credentials? How would you continue to engage in transactions? And there's a great lesson from what the credit card companies do. If you have monitored transactional behavior of a relatively long time customer for a period of time, uh, algorithms will teach you when there's a diversion or something that's anomalous. It doesn't mean that there's no reason for that. But that might be a highlight to take a deeper look at whether this is properly authorized or not. Behavioral analysis and pattern tracing can be a very useful tool in separating transactions that require a closer look from transactions that you can more or less accept as routine if the basics of authentication are there. Encryption, uh, that could be a discussion in itself. But again, a critical element of safeguarding data, both in terms of your business data and your customer data. Likewise, backing up, so you have the ability to restore service and to restore records uh, is a critical, again, element of something what you need to talk about. And finally, crisis response. You have to have a plan for what to do if there is a crisis, a serious compromise of credentials, a serious compromise of authentication, a serious hack. You need to know both who your responders are what your plan B is, and what your method of communication is. So I, I commend to you as you think about the architecture, you look at these, at these issues. And let me make three final points, and then I do, I do want to put this open for a few questions. Um, more and more of what you've got to look at is third-party dependencies. Um, you're transacting business with others, and their dependencies, if they connect to your network, can become your dependencies. And it's not just other financial institutions. It's literally the folks who are doing your heating and your cooling and other things of that sort. And of course, the target hack was a great example of, again, an HVAC system uh, um, operator who plugged into the network and introduced malware into uh, the network of target. So you've got to look at how do you verify that they have a reasonable degree of cybersecurity. And finally, as we get to the explosion of the Internet of Things, everything is now going to be smart and connected. These things are not built with security in mind. Interestingly, many of them have no provision for changing passwords or for updating or for patching or for many, making any kinds of changes. And this becomes a problem not only for you in terms of your own network, uh, because I know of several cases where someone went into a thermostat, hacked into a thermostat, and used that to get into the main network of an enterprise. But it's not only a problem for you, it's a problem for everybody else. Because if you looked at the Mirai um, episode, DDoS, denial of service episode, of a year ago, uh, basically the, the botnet that was used to attack a domain name registry was not just you know, the normal PCs and, and laptops and phones, it was literally cameras, uh, thermostats, all of this which was constructed into a huge botnet that created a volume of, of denial of service attack unlike that which we've seen. So we need to start to think about how do we build security into that and how do we make sure we don't get so enamored of 
smart things that we don't think carefully how we want to architect that with the rest of our system. Finally, the last point I was going to make is this. Um, there is a discussion increasing now about how do you deal with cyber warfare. And one of the questions is, how do we address the threat and the concern that the financial system could become a battle space for cyber warfare? You see a little hint of this with the North Koreans, because they don't really participate in the global financial system. So they essentially fund themselves through crime, whether it's counterfeiting or drug smuggling or uh, uh, hacking. Really, this is their way of sustaining their economy. As we get more and more into the use of sanctions as a tool for glo uh, global geopolitics, um, more and more we run the risk that actors will begin to look at the financial system as a battle space. I'm going to be at, the, at a pre-meeting for the G20 later this month, and there are proposals on the table to start to discuss how do we construct international norms that tell uh, countries that really the financial system is off limits to being bombed with cyber attacks, just as hospitals and schools are. So there's a lot to think about, um, but I think the good news is you've got a lot of people thinking about it. And I think I have a few minutes left to take a couple of questions. If you just raise your hand and tell us who you are. Yes. Someone over. Thank you. Hi, uh, Bill Reichman. Um, you opened with some comments about current events, and I wondered uh, one thing that hit the newspapers recently uh, that uh, hit recently but wasn't current was the 20 CIA agents in uh, China that were either killed or jailed maybe uh, seven or eight years ago. I wonder, um, is, was that a cyber? It was a few years before the OPM hack, but yeah. w w was, was that a cyber event? And and what are we doing about that? Well, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not, I can't say I'm, I'm enlightened in this. Uh, I've read the same story you have. I know that what they're looking at is, was there a mole inside a human mole? Uh, we've seen that before historically. Was it a cyber attack? Was it some combination? Was there something in the trade craft that was done that exposed somebody? I mean, there are any number of possibilities. You mentioned the OPM hack, though, and I think one of the, the uh, inferences that was drawn from that is uh, there's value from a, a counterintelligence standpoint for our adversaries to get access to a lot of personal data. Because um, when, if someone is operating undercover, um, then knowing what the real life pattern is may allow someone to be identified and outed, and that, that becomes a real concern. What we've seen more and more is the power of being able to collect and accumulate data, which gives there's both po really positive things in terms of preventing bad things from happening, but there's real opportunity for, for both adversary nation states and for criminal groups to use that to target and to um, ultimately attack our people who are friends of ours and our citizens. And so managing the issue of big data both as a defensive matter and an offensive matter is, I think, one of the big intelligence challenges of this decade. Hi, I'm Will Schweitzer uh, with GRA Quantum. Um, what do you think the role of the federal government should be moving forward to protect private corporations and private citizens when we're looking at nation state actors being you know, increasingly uh, interested in the data that these, that these private companies and individuals possess? Uh, well, you know, as you, as you all know, most of the infrastructure uh, on which the networks operate are in private hands. So this is not like you're dealing with conventional military defense where, you know, you thought someone's going to launch a missile or a bomber and the Air Force is going to shoot it down. Uh, because the battle is going to occur, for the most part, on private networks. And uh, I don't think our government is equipped, and frankly, I don't think our public wants the government to operate all the private networks and live on it. So the question is, how do you integrate security and private networks and what the government brings to the table? And what the government brings to the table is intelligence, um, best practices and, technolo and technological insights, 
and the ability to help coordinate among a lot of actors, both governmental and private. Um, and I think that's really where we need to go. On the one hand, we need to uh, do a better job, although we've been improving, in sharing information and intelligence about incoming threats, not just those that have happened already, but things that might be on the horizon. And that means, to some extent, we have to streamline our ability of clearing people in the security business to get that information. Uh, I know in the financial sector, you have really now, maybe more than any other sector, real uh, focus on information sharing platforms. Uh, the ISAC platforms that operate with among the various entities, and now proposals to get the financial sector actually involved with the government in helping to identify where the government ought to be collecting intelligence that's of value to the private sector. So I think that those are important developments. And of course, the technological innovation of the private sector is important. But the reality is the government's not going to take the burden on itself. And a lot of what has to be done um, maybe the 80% low-hanging fruit is training your employees not to do things that are silly, making sure your stuff is upgraded and modernized, building an architecture in your own company that maximizes your ability to protect. And that's not stuff the government's going to do. It can guide you. It can give you advice. But in the end, the ownership of this is, just as the ownership of your financial system is, is in private hands, is going to be in the private sector. Yeah, hello, Danny Jenkins from Threat Locker. I'm, I'm intrigued to know what the government is doing to protect their own networks in addition to worrying about the private networks. Cases like Edward Snowden, where he managed to walk out of probably the most secure government network in the country with piles of classified information and leaked them to the press. Why, well, why shouldn't the government know what people are walking out with before they release it? Surely the most secure network in the country should know, uh, they should know what's been leaked and what's been accessed before he's even able to access the, exit the building. I, I could not agree more. I mean, I think that was, that was a, uh, a real shakeup, to be honest. Um, you know, there's a book I, written by uh, Edward J. Epstein, an interesting book that just came out. And I'm saying this because everything I'm telling you comes out of the book. I'm not telling you stuff that I can't talk about. But it lays out an interesting you know, uh, story about how Snowden was able to exploit uh, human beings within his own organization in order to get himself close to certain things. And there are some human failings and security failings. And I think this, what the Snowden uh, episode did is it reminded us that the biggest vulnerability in truth now is not a, a, you know, a, a hole in the firewall, but it's an, an employee who either negligently or intelligently in, deliberately wants to do something. I come back to behavioral analytics. Um, the ability to manage and monitor what is going on in your network, uh, not just rules-based, but actually learning over time and connecting up anomalies is, is maybe the best way I know to focus on people who might be a risk in terms of, of the insider threat. And um, again, there's no guarantee, but um, particularly if you're in a sensitive area, even looking at people's social media or their external travel patterns and things of that sort can be very helpful. We've still built our background check system out of the Cold War. Foreign travel, foreign relatives, things like that. And I understand that there's value in knowing that. But what do you do with someone who's ideologically driven? They get disgruntled, or they're captivated by some narrative on the internet, and that all of a sudden persuades them to become disloyal. You're not going to pick that up by seeing how many times somebody traveled overseas. So understanding that when you take certain kinds of employment, you have to sign up to sacrifice some privacy, I think we need to look to that as a way of supplementing the traditional way of monitoring insider threats. Uh, Sean Webner, Nisus Group. Do you think that there is, uh, or rather, how do you measure the line of too much reliance on um, machine learning and statistical modeling, given that you know some people would argue there really is no normal? Um, and as statistical models go, they try to define what's normal to be able to identify what isn't normal. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I think I don't. I'm not a believer that machine learning is a panacea. It's a way of focusing your attention on things that need to be looked at more closely. And I would never let the machine make the final decision. 
what the machine is doing for you is highlighting, you better take a closer look at this because there's something anomalous. And by the way, it's not perfect. I mean, you could, someone who is, is kind of all of a sudden falling off the bus and doing something they've never done before one time and then grab it and run is not gonna be picked up by machine learning. But as with all risk, <clears throat> there's no risk elimination. It's risk management. And this happens to be a useful tool for risk management. I think I've got time for one more. Hi, I'm Rena Singh of Hermetic Solutions. My question is, could you spend a little time talking about what the developments are in law and the legal situation to deal with cyber threats, particularly from the viewpoint of non-state actors that are perpetuating the attacks? Well, that could be a whole topic itself. Um, I think, the, look, uh, the legal system, it was built in a in a era, for the most part, prior to the development of the internet, even those statutes that deal with uh, crimes on the internet go back years and are outpaced by technological developments. But nevertheless, this is the legal system that we have. The big challenge with non-state actors is this: How do you apprehend them and bring them into face justice? We can deal with the forensics and the evidence and all of that, but often what you see is the criminals are inhabiting. Uh, locations overseas where either the local country doesn't have the capability or doesn't have the interest in actually surrendering them. Um, and to pick two examples, we indicted, the US indicted uh, three individuals from the People's Liberation Army in China a few years ago. The chances of them seeing the inside of a courtroom are somewhere between zero and less than zero. But it did send a message and it did send a little bit of a warning that uh, enterprises that benefit from this kind of intellectual property theft could ultimately be the targets of criminal investigations. And that is a little bit of, a, of an inhibition. Likewise, the Russian indictment we saw just in the last few months uh, involving two intelligence officials, they're not coming to face trial soon. But again, it's an indication that you could use these tools to pursue beneficiaries of this activity in parts of the world where legal process operates. A good example of that is if you look at the um, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is controversial. I don't want to you know, get too much into it. But under that statute, the US government has been able to deal with corruption in many places around the world based on a very tangential um, interaction with the United States. So I do think what we're going to see developed over time is um, a set of strategies that will allow us to use the legal tools as, a, as one of a number of capabilities in, in dealing with non-state actors. And I also think part of what I'm hoping we will see through these norms we're talking about is greater cooperation among states in actually surrendering people to face justice. Because most of the adversary states we deal with have a stake in the financial services industry. Take a look at the wanna cry um, episode. It looks to be that the Russians took some hits on that too. So that doesn't help them any. Um, and I think the more of this kind of global um, impact you see, the more there may be opportunities to work even with sometime adversaries to at least stake out areas like financial services, where we all agree it's in the common interest to make sure nobody winds up ruining the system. Kind of the way we look at the, at the law of the sea and the fact that we don't want to destroy the sea lanes. So stay tuned, an interesting area, and one that's developing. Anyway, lots to talk about, but thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.